Please welcome um, Carl Rodriguez, who will talk about the era of gravitational wave astronomy, which I guess we're now in, right? <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, Peter. Um, all right. Hi, everybody. My name is Carl Rodriguez. I'm uh, sort of this last year Popolardo fellow, and I'm going to be talking about some of the stuff I've been doing over the past couple of years. This is almost like a sequel to the talk I gave the first time around. Um, and it's also just going to be more generally um, sort of an overview of all the cool stuff going on in gravitational wave astronomy and astrophysics. And to that end, I always like to start off with this particular plot, because I think it gives us a really clear indication of just how radically this field has changed over the last four years. So from 1968 all the way up to 2014, this was pretty much everything we knew about stellar mass black holes in the universe. They were roughly 5 to 15 times the mass of the sun. There were a few claimed detections more massive than that, but they had huge systematic errors with them. And everything we knew about this came from electromagnetic radiation, mostly in the, in the form of X-ray observations. And then 2015 comes around, and this sucker comes out of nowhere, a 30 plus 35 solar mass binary black hole merger detected through gravitational waves by the LIGO Gravitational Wave Observatory. Um, I'm sure everyone has seen this a dozen times by now, but it's an oldie and a goodie, so let's play it again. This is the 0.2 seconds of the gravitational wave that were detected by both interferometers. Um, and in 0.2 seconds, we single-handedly witnessed the most energetic event ever detected by any terrestrial or space-based observatory. And if you pipe this over the speakers, you can actually directly hear it. Or not. <laughs> hmm. I'm going to do that again, because that's very, very disappointing. There we go. And so that little right at the end, the chirp, is the last few cycles of these binary black holes before they merge together to create a new massive black hole at the end. Now this was the, the, the name of the game when I last gave this talk in 2016. Since then, this lands, 2017, sorry, I forgot how long I've been here. Um, this, since then, has upgraded a little bit, and we are now up to 10 confirmed gravitational wave detections. Um, 10 binary black holes plus a neutron star, GW170817. This, by the way, is just the detected one so far. We have another five binary black holes sort of in the pipeline that Salvo and his poor students and postdocs are furiously working on. And from, from in the, over the past three years, we've expanded this landscape from a single detected event all the way up and completely filled out this entirely new population of binary black holes. And I think it's kind of important to stop here and emphasize something kind of crazy. In the last three years, we have detected the majority of stellar mass black holes that we have detected through gravitational waves. In three years of gravitational wave astronomy, we have, si we have single-handedly outdone 50 years of electromagnetic observations. So that's cool. Um, but the question is, what can we actually do with these as far as astrophysics goes? How can we take this entirely new window onto the universe and convert it into something that we can use to understand stars, star clusters, the nature of gravity and space and time itself? And so that's what I've sort of been working on for the past few years. Um, generally speaking, to make this work and to do gravitational wave astronomy with these things we're seeing, you need to understand where binary black holes and binary neutron stars are coming from. And generally speaking, these formation channels fall into one of two categories. The first is, you know, if I look out just in, in the galaxy, this is actually the center of our own galaxy, um, most of the things that I see on the night sky are not actually single stars. They're binary stars or aggregates of stars. And in fact, if I start off with a binary star, that's sufficiently massive, so let's say each one of its components is 40 or 50 times the mass of the sun at least, at the end of its life, this, these two stars will collapse to leave behind black holes. And if you tune the gastrophysics of this interaction just right, if you make sure that the mass transfer and the evolutionary process is tuned just right, then you can be left with a binary black hole at the end of it. Now this is one way we think you can get these objects, but it requires a lot of fine tuning and a lot of astrophysics that we really don't understand not to mention a lot of plasma physics that is just extremely hard to do. What I do is sort of the alternate theory to this. Um, instead of looking at massive binary stars out in the galaxy, what if we instead consider giant aggregation of stars? What if we look at giant clusters of stars that happen to exist out there in the universe? So I'm zooming in here to uh, gl uh, the globular cluster 47 Tuck, which is one of these old massive star clusters that sort of litter our own galaxy and pretty much every other galaxy that we see. It's comprised of about a million stars, give or take, all packed into a very, very tiny region of space. 
The stellar density of objects in the center of this cluster is roughly a factor of 10 to the 4 or 10 to the 5 greater than the density of stars around our own solar system. And if I zoom even further into this, into this um, star cluster, you can kind of get a sense for what's going on. So I'm going to play this movie now. And what you're looking at here is essentially a, crate, a simulation that was made as sort of the end part of my dissertation of what we think the dynamics going on in the center of these star clusters actually looks like. And so what I'm showing here is about 500 or so stars from the center of one of these star clusters and about 50 or so black holes. Now the black holes on statistical average are more massive than the stars in the cluster, and so they very rapidly sink into the center of that star cluster. At that point, you suddenly have a very, very high density of objects. We're talking 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 objects per parsec cubed. And at that point, you can start to have complicated two-body, three-body, even four-body encounters. Whereas normally in space, you might have, you know, one star will occasionally come and annoy another star. In these star clusters, you have such a high density of objects that you can get multi-body interactions occurring with alarming regularity. And in fact, if the star cluster, if these kind of interactions didn't occur, the star cluster would actually start to collapse in on itself. It's actually the dynamics and the collapse of the star cluster itself that produces these many body encounters. Now, if we look at these black holes, you can imagine they're frequently jostling each other around, doing all sorts of weird dynamical gravitational stuff. Um, I actually got the phrase at some point, black hole mosh pit, into an accepted FJ letters, which I'm still super pleased with myself three years later for. And if I watch this long enough, eventually two of these black holes are going to get close enough to one another that they will actually dynamically capture in a multi-body encounter and create a bound binary system. And so that's what just happened here. And so if we zoom in on this and ask how did that happen, that's where some of the actually interesting dynamical physics of this comes from. So I'm talking about these, these mini-body encounters where you can dynamically create binaries. But why do we actually need mini-bodies? Energetically speaking, it, it kind of makes sense, right? If I just start off with two-point particles and I toss them at one another, you know, positive energy in, positive energy out, there's not going to be any way to dissipate the energy I need to actually create a bound binary, right? Remember, in, in Newtonian dynamics, a binary has negative energy. So what I need is some way to dissipate this energy and angular momentum from this encounter and create a bound system. Now, in the fields of galaxies, the stellar density is just way, way too low. I'm never going to get these kind of encounters happening. But in these dense star clusters, where I have interloping particles, it is actually fairly common to have those three-body encounters where I can dump some excess energy and angular momentum onto a third interloping particle. And in that process, you can actually go from an unbound system to a bound system. Now, at this point, I have just a binary black hole hanging out in the center of a star cluster. There are still a ton of other stars and black holes there that it's going to mess with. And at this point, I've essentially created a giant target in the center of this star cluster. And like any good target in a particle physics experiment, I'm basically going to continue to bombard it with other particles to see what happens. Now, if you're feeling particularly field theoretic and just a little bit masochistic, you can actually express this using Feynman diagrams. You can try to energetically separate out the space and treat it as a perturbation theory. This doesn't actually work, which is why nobody actually does it this way, but you can if you're feeling particularly inclined. Unlike Bernard, I'm not particularly keen on doing integrals all day, so we actually just set up numerical integrators where we take the direct three-body equations of motion and turn the crank on a computer. And so what I'm showing here is what happens to a binary as I throw an interloping particle at it. And what you can see is you have many, many sort of vert, um, small interactions in the middle. You can think about them as virtual particle interactions if you like. And each time this happens, you end up exchanging energy and angular momentum between these two until eventually I create a new binary that has been ejected from the encounter. Now, the one thing that we can say about this um, from sort of statistical mechanics considerations is that on statistical average, every time I have one of these encounters, the binary is going to lose some of its energy and leave the encounter more closely bound than it was to begin with. And so that's sort of the key. Even if I form a binary that's far too far apart to ever merge within the age of the universe and create gravitational waves, by sticking it like a target in this giant particle accelerator of a cluster, I can characteristically shrink the binary until it does merge within the age of the universe and create something that we can detect in LIGO and Virgo. So this is sort of where I was about 2017. We had these two, give or take, formation channels for binary black hole formation. There were, I always like to set it up this way because it makes it a nice, clean, and easy story. In reality, there are still more theories for binary formation than there are actual binary black holes detection, detected because, you know, theorists got to earn a paycheck too. 
But the real question is, can we tell the difference? Can we actually take all of the things we're seeing from LIGO and Virgo and start to do astrophysics with that? So what I said about two years ago, and Neil might remember this among others, was that maybe we could use the spins of the black holes as a way to discriminate these two populations. Um, you typically expect the spins of the black holes to be mostly aligned with their orbits. You expect the black holes to essentially be spinning in the same direction as, as, the, as the orbit is from uh, massive stars, mostly because we think most massive binaries formed out of a single cloud of gas. Dynamical formation, on the other hand, you expect to just do really whatever it wants. You'll get an isotropic distribution where the spin vectors are randomly distributed on the sphere. And so the original idea that I had a couple of years ago was that, well, maybe we can directly measure that. It turns out that binary black holes with spin exhibit the same sort of spin orbit and spin-spin coupling that um, quantum mechanical systems do. And that spin orbit and spin-spin coupling actually imprints itself on the gravitational wave. If I have a binary whose spins are aligned with the orbital angular momentum, I get a nice smooth chirp that just increases in frequency and amplitude right up until merging. On the other hand, if I rotate these spins down into the plane, the gravitational wave, which I'm showing here on the right, starts to develop these amplitude modulations, essentially like somebody is dialing up and down the volume on your gravitational wave detector. And the reason for that is, when you have a mis spin misaligned system, the binary will essentially appear to precess in 3D space as the orbital angular momentum spins around the total angular momentum of the system. And as the binary is pointing towards us, suddenly you hear those amplitude modulations in the gravitational waveform. LIGO and Virgo are more sensitive to binaries that are face-on than are edge-on. I'm not going to play this all the way through, but essentially the, the claim back in 2017 was that if you could measure these spin modulations, you could use that to discriminate formation channels. And I wrote a paper on this, was very pleased with myself, had all these thoughts, and then after 10 de detections, LIGO produced a bunch of posteriors, all of which happened to lie right at zero. And so it turns out either the spins are in a configuration that is very, very undetectable by LIGO, or black holes just don't have large spins. So that sucked. Um, so we were forced to address the question, you know, what if most black holes are just born intrinsically with low spins? This, however, turns out to have a very, very neat implication. And that's what I'm going to talk about for the last five or 10 minutes or so. So if most black holes have low spins, then it turns out that can actually affect the dynamics of the black holes during these three and four body encounters themselves. So if I go back to this picture, you remember I, I said you need some way during a, during a close encounter to dissipate energy and angular momentum. Now in this particular case, I said that has to be a third object, right? You need some third object in the encounter to dump that energy onto. But the other thing that is really good at carrying away energy from a system like this is actually gravitational waves itself. And so the first thing that I decided to look at was, well, what if we take these same scattering encounters, these same dynamical encounters that we were looking at before, and we add relativistic corrections to them? So this is that same encounter that I showed before, but now I've added essentially post-Newtonian corrections to the dynamics, including the correction and corrective terms that account for the emission of gravitational waves. I speed this encounter up in the middle because otherwise it takes a while. But every time these two particles get right into the center, they have a lot of close passages. The black holes whiz by one another until eventually two of them get so close that they merge instantaneously on the time scale of the movie. And if the new binary black hole and the new black hole in red gets shot out at a random angle. So what happens is if I zoom in on this, is you, it's actually what's called gravitational wave brimstralung. Literally two objects whiz by one another, unbound, create a massive purse burst of gravitational waves that takes the total system from positive to negative energy and creates a very rapidly merging binary. I'm going to show essentially the last few days of this, of this encounter right here when they first become bound, and I'm going to show the gravitational wave right along here. And so right at this point, instead of a nice smooth waveform, you get a single instantaneous pulse. And if you actually listen to what this gravitational wave sounds like, it sounds like a lawnmower. They're not quite the same, uh, the same movie and, and, uh, and uh, audio, I'm afraid. I'm not quite that sophisticated. But the nice thing about that sound is that even though most of the eccentricity dissipates by the time you get to the LIGO band, there's still enough that LIGO could detect those weird non-circularities in the waveform by the time these binaries merge within their horizon. So that's cool. That's one way that we could use relativity to sort of identify different formation channels. The other interesting thing about this, though, is that if I add these relativistic corrections, 
It turns out that about half of all of these binary black holes merge inside the star clusters themselves. And so that turns out to have a really, really interesting implication. So you might have noticed right at the end of this, something really bizarre happened, right? Right at the point of merger, the, the heavy black hole appeared to get a kick, right? Which makes no sense. Where did that actually come from? It turns out that kick is actually a direct momentum kick from the emission of gravitational waves themselves. So I ran this particular simulation with the black holes having some intrinsic spin. And because of that spin, at the point of merger, these two black holes essentially, got a, essentially emitted all of their gravitational waves in one direction. The resultant black hole gets shot off in the other direction. And that's sort of what you see coming out of a, tra a trail right here. Now, this is sort of why people have never considered multiple mergers in these clusters before. Because when we thought that black holes all had large spins, as high as you could make them in relativity, it turns out that the typical speed you get from black holes um, that merge in these clusters is about 1,000 kilometers a second. The black holes are going to merge and get thrown out about 10 times faster than the escape speed from the cluster. So every time you have one of these mergers, the binary is just going to get thrown out into space. But what if LIGO is right? What if it turns out that black holes are just intrinsically born with zero spin? In that case, this distribution gets essentially pushed down to here. Because now, without any sort of intrinsic spin to break the symmetry of the gravitational wave emission, your gravitational waves are being, uh, are being emitted isotropically on the sphere. And so now, your, your radiation recoil kicks are maybe only a few tens to maybe 100 kilometers a second. So you can actually build up a second generation of black holes that can find themselves another partner and merge again. And so this was something we showed last year, which is that if you allow this process to occur inside dense star clusters, and you do that by considering the fully relativistic dynamics in these encounters, you can actually create black holes with total masses greater than what you can get from single stars. It turns out we think you can't actually form black holes more massive than about 40 times the mass of the sun from a single star. And so that's just sort of what I've been doing for the past couple of years since I, since I first talked to Neil a couple of years ago. I also, I'd just like to end at this point by sort of mentioning exactly what the horizon is like now. So right now, we've already got LIGO and Virgo detecting probably on order about 100 to a few hundred binary black holes per year once they reach design sensitivity and are operating in steady state. At the same time, the pulsar timing people are continuing to time those pulsars, looking for the most massive black hole mergers in the universe. Uh, circa 2030s. The LISA space-based interferometer will fly, giving us an unprecedented look at the supermassive black holes in the center of smaller galaxies. And circa 2040s, the next generation of LIGOs are essentially going to start coming online, things like Cosmic Explorer and Einstein Telescope. And at that point, we might actually be able to detect binary black hole mergers out to beyond redshift of 10. Now, for people that don't really think in redshift regularly, we think the majority of star formation occurred at about redshift of 2, and we think most stars started turning on not much past redshift of 10. So it is entirely possible that by 2040, we will detect every black hole merger everywhere in the observable universe. So that's also cool. So that's essentially where the field is heading. We are moving into this massive regime where we are going to get an entirely unprecedented look at where every binary black hole of every mass at every point in the universe can be detected here on Earth. And so now the question is, how do we actually get ready to do astrophysics and cosmology with this? And so with that, I'm just going to thank everybody that I've worked with over the past couple of years. Uh, Scott Hughes, Jackie Hewitt, and Nergis um, were nice enough to fund a lot of my, I, my sort of uh, research endeavors over the past few years. Um, I've also thrown up a bunch of people I've collaborated with over the past couple of years here. And obviously, of course, uh, Neil and Jane, uh, without whom this would not have been possible in the first place. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carl. Questions from the front row? I would argue, you talked about spin, mm -hmm. uh, but there's another at attribute of black holes that, does that have any other factor? I mean... Do you mean the charge of the black charge? holes? Does that have any effect on mm -hmm. if there was a, two different black holes that are presumably combined in some sort mm -hmm. of rotation, one with a significantly different charge than the other one. Would that produce any differences in the waveforms? It would produce some extraordinarily bizarre results. So there are three parameters that can describe any black hole in the universe. It's mass, it's spin, and it's charge. We usually ignore the charge because it turns out to be, yeah, because it turns out to be very difficult to create an electrically charged black hole. 
If you can, though, then things start to get real weird. You can imagine having two positively charged black holes. You essentially elongate the waveform because they start to repel each other as they get closer in. The other and even stranger part is that if I have this thing moving at about 50% uh, about, you know, the speed of light right before merger, I have this essentially a giant electrical charge moving in a, in, in a, in a circular speed um, with an acceleration. So I'm throwing off huge amounts of radiation. Um, essentially, I turn the entire thing into a giant space-based circuit. Well, have, we, if, have we observed anything where the waveform is, if you will, doesn't look like the traditional chirp sound, if you will, that we question that charge could have caused it? Not to my knowledge. I think Salvo would know better than me, but I'm pretty sure all the binary black holes we've seen to date can be explained with some combination of mass and spin. Salvo here? <laughs> I mean, um, how easy is parameter estimation on eccentric spinning binaries? <laughs> okay, I'll leave that be. Then. Well, Wolfgang. You raised the question, but I'm not sure if I understood the answer. Uh, what is now the situation with spin? Are we sort of expecting black holes to have spin, or do we understand that they get rid of the angular momentum? So this is actually a, a still an open question, and it was actually really bizarre. We thought for the longest time that pretty much every black hole would be born near maximally spinning, and there were two reasons for that. The first is just, I mean, simple, simple like classical mechanics. You, you know, I take some massive star, even if it's rotating very, very slow, if I crunch the thing down to 100 kilometers, like you know, that angular momentum is, has to go somewhere. The, the more sophisticated observational answer was that we have spin measurements from X-ray binaries, and most of those, up to you know, the ability we could get um, with systematics in the modeling, seem to be spinning uh, near maximal. Oh, sorry, the maximal speed is, is sort of set by, by general relativity. Um, there's two different ways you can think about it. Um, if I attach a, a, if a black hole spinning at maximum, it would be equivalent to a spot on the event horizon moving at the speed of light in a circular orbit. Another way to think about it would be if I dialed anything above that, I would break cosmic censorship and break causality. Um, and a lot of people get unhappy when you do that. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> so, so originally people thought that like everything LIGO would see would have near maximal spins because that was consistent with what we had thought from simple scaling arguments and observations. Unfortunately, just about everything LIGO has measured, with a couple of exceptions, are consistent with black holes having low spins. Now I should mention one caveat before, before Salvo comes up here and attacks me which is that what LIGO measures is not the spin magnitude themselves, it's the projections of the spins onto the orbital angular momentum. Um, so it could be that the spins are all zero, or it could be that the spins are essentially lying in the plane. Um, but if we go back to that plot, we have 10 binary black hole mergers so far, and they are all essentially lying right around at zero. So even if they were all randomly picked off the sphere, at some point you're not going to get everything near lying at zero. There's this one weird corner case right here, but that has uh, several different weird things associated with it. Julieta. Oh. Uh, to which one? Um, sure. Uh, before you go for dinner, um, the one, the one good one I've heard. Differential rotation within massive stars is the short answer. Essentially, I have this massive star that's rotating. Once it blows up onto the giant branch, um, you know, now I have this giant envelope and a, a core from the star. And we think during the supernova, most of the envelope is going to get ejected. And so the idea is that if I have the core and the envelope rotating at different rates, I can, no, sorry, I've got that backwards. Um, if I have the core and the envelope both ra rotating, I can essentially extract all of the angular momentum from the core dump it into the envelope, and then the envelope gets partially ejected into space when the black hole collapses. Um, there are some stellar theorists that have been saying, oh yeah, we've been saying that for years. Um, cool. Um, but I, I would say that, I, I mean, I would say I could be, I don't know enough about the complicated like magne magnetohydrodynamics involved in stellar structure. So it, it makes sense to me, but I could honestly be convinced either way. 
Uh, you'd have to basically ex you'd have to basically examine the dynamics inside massive stars, and there are very very few massive stars. The Not to my knowledge, no. Um, I don't think so, essentially. Because even then, the, the explosions are mostly asymmetric, and we don't see what happens to the core afterwards. Mm -hmm. Jackie? Yeah, just wondering if you all are convinced there are any systematic selection effects to producing this result. Is that the major risk? Uh, oh, uh, I'm, OK, I'm sorry, Sal. I'm about to throw you under the bus here. So. Uh, well, not you specifically. Um, so I don't think there are any systematics with the parameter estimation. However, there is a separate group that has started downloading the LIGO data. They're based at the IAS down in Princeton. And they've essentially started redoing the LIGO analysis from scratch. And in doing so, they have identified five new binary black hole candidates within the publicly released LIGO data that are not part of the LIGO catalogs. Now, those are by, now those are by the nature of the pipeline um, more tentative uh, events than, than when LIGO is seen, but they have some very interesting spin dynamics going on. One of them is like somewhere around up here at 0.9, which is already very interesting because that can actually only be created by, I think, one particular formation channel. Um, there are some that are lying at about negative 0.7, which could really only come from dynamics or a very, very crazy uh, triple system, which I did a little bit of work on but didn't talk about. Um, and so I think, I think some of the LIGO people are going back through the data and sort of chatting with uh, the, the IES people. And so it's possible that we might actually have 20 binary uh, gravitational wave detections by now instead of 10. Julieta. Ooh, um, I don't think there are systematic, no, there are, mm. to the systematics answer, I'm actually not sure. Um, there have, or sorry, when I say systematics, I mean, <laughs> they're both systematic issues. So there's the systematic issue of whether or not there's something wrong with the way you model the, the binary, um, the X-ray binaries. And there are two separate methods. One involves um, sort of continuum fitting of, of the disk spectra, and one involves actually looking at iron K alpha lines and sort of how, I'm actually unclear on this, but I think how redshifted it is as it gets close to the, the horizon. Uh, Jackie can correct me, or Jackie or Salvo can correct me on that if I'm wrong. That, I think, has always had large error bars, but there have always been a few that seem to have very high spins. Um, whether or not we are more likely to detect highly spinning X-ray binaries, I actually don't know. I, I can't think of any reason why we would, but I can't think of any reason why we wouldn't. So. More questions. Yeah, I kind of have like a crazier idea for low speed since I can advertise the work of Ken who's in the back of the room. Oh, sure. So some people have suggested that, I mean, if axions exist, so I'm yes. going to some people on the other side of the room, <laughs> they can form clouds around black holes and they can suck the spin of the black hole, mm -hmm. bringing it down. And that would explain why you know, Lagos black holes have little spin. Oh yeah, there's a, there's a crazy notion out there that you can essentially get axions. I don't actually quite understand how this works because I don't really understand QFT at all. That's why I was making fun of it earlier. Um, <laughs> but there's this crazy idea that you can essentially get axions bound um, to different energy levels around black holes that they will slowly extract angular momentum from it as they form these axion clouds around the black hole. The upside of that to gravitational waves is that as this happens, you will slowly suck the spin out of the black holes and essentially go back from Kerr to Schwarzschild. Now that has some crazy implications to it, not only from the you know, very obvious particle physics implications, but to the uh, gravitational wave implications as well. To be perfectly honest, if this process operated very efficiently, you actually really wouldn't, you would be much more likely, I think, to create supermassive black holes and intermediate mass black holes through runaway collisions. Because if suddenly you're not spinning up the black holes every time they merge, and you can grind down that spin afterwards, you could actually repeatedly um, start merging black holes together and get a runaway. So I think the fact that every globular cluster does not have an intermediate mass black hole on it already puts some limits on this particular um, axion black hole um, interaction. But I don't really know enough QFT to write that paper, and I have other papers to write, so it's. <laughs> oh, you're writing that paper. Oh. You, you just wrote the paper. We have a recording. We can transcribe it. Cool. <laughs> OK. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. I'd like to thank the speakers.
I would like to thank Neil and Jane uh, for being here, and Howard and Colleen, and Kurt Marble, and Mark Mueller, and Hale. Uh, and I'd like to thank everyone for coming and, and listening to our, our wonderful Papalardo fellows. Um, as a final note, I just want to put another plug in for World Metrology Day, which is on May 20th, and we're going to have a special talk from for Professor Ketterly about why we don't have to think about a kilogram sitting outside of Paris. Uh, so come hear about that. Uh, thank you, and take care.